Videotape to film transfer made by WTTW Recording Services, Chicago. The following program is paid for by the National Farmers Organization. Why the NFO is presented to acquaint farmers of this area with collective bargaining for agriculture. Here is the Indiana National Director for the NFO, Mr. Glenn Utley. Thank you and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to take this time to thank you for letting me come into your homes and explain the National Farmers Organization to you. I know there's been lots of meetings held in this area, but the still, there's a lot of farmers that have a misunderstanding about the NFO, and in this short time this afternoon, I will try to explain the main parts of it to you. Now, what we're doing in the National Farmers Organization is nothing more than what other segments of the economy are doing. In other words, we're trying to get in a position to price the commodities that we have on our farms instead of taking the market and saying, what will you give me for them? We're the only segment of the economy that actually produce anything and then take it to market and say, what will you give me for it? In other words, we let somebody else price our commodities and we want to get in a position to price them ourselves through collective bargaining. Now, collective bargaining is not new to agriculture. Some segments use it. Some of the dairy industry is using collective bargaining now. And it will work in all segments of agriculture if we as farmers will apply it. So all we have to do is organize as farmers, and then we can do the job. Now, the reason the farmer has to organize is because it's being forced on him. It is at the point today, whether it doesn't make any difference, whether you like organization or whether you don't. We're living in an organized economy. Everything that we buy as farmers, we buy from organization. Everything that we sell, we sell to organization. So as an individual operating in an organized economy, you're not going to operate it in it too long. That's the reason we're getting less in number in agriculture every year. So that is why that the farmer has to organize. Now, they've always told the farmer that the reason he couldn't get a price was overproduction. We were producing too much. I like to go into that just a little. I don't have the time to cover the whole subject and talk about this overproduction just a little, especially in the meat. Now, we haven't in this country for the last 10 to 12 years produced enough of meat to feed us. We have had to import meat at the rate of a billion to a billion, 400 million pounds per year. I like to go back to the years of 55, 56, and 59 when we had 10 cent hogs. That was years they told us we had too many hogs. They didn't know what to do with them. But still in those years, we imported into this country from foreign countries nearly a billion pounds of meat. Now, I'm quoting you that from government figures, livestock and meat statistics, which are official government documents, and anybody can send and get them. It gives you the imports, exports, and all. And we've imported nearly eight, nine times more meat into this country than we've exported. Now, the reason for it is, as the ones that control our market are your corporate agriculture, your big feed lots, they have to have cheap feed to operate those lots. So they had to get in control of the grain situation to have that cheap feed. So the big packers, the big chain stores is what controls these lots. They are also the ones that are importing this meat from foreign countries. And as they import this meat from foreign countries, that's that much grain that we're not feeding in this country. It's grain that we're saving. If we was feeding the meat, we should be feeding. I don't think we're producing any more than enough of grain to feed it. But as we don't feed it, we take it over, hang it over the grain man's head to hold the price of the grain down, and then those corporate setups have cheap feed to put in to their integrated setups. 
Now, that's that free market that you hear so much about that we in agriculture operate on. It's that supply and demand that you hear so much about that we're supposed to operate on. Supply and demand doesn't work. It never did work, and it never will work. For the simple reason, the people that's buying our products are organized, and they're highly organized. That's something that the farmer don't want to forget. So we're going to have to get in a position to price. Now, people tell us in agriculture that we can't price, that the farmer shouldn't price. But I don't see why he shouldn't. All other segments of the economy do. And the very people that's telling us in agriculture that we can't get together in price are people that's on a guaranteed salary or they don't have any production to sell. That's the people that's telling us, or they're either buying our production. That's the people that's telling us that we can't do it. Now, we can do it. We're going to do it. Because that is why that we're organizing. That's why we're getting together. We've built an organization here within a matter of a few years that I think we in agriculture can be proud of. We have done a lot. Now, to get back to pricing, that's something that scares the people in the city to death. When the farmer talks about getting a price, he's going to price his commodities. Everybody says then that the fellow in town can't eat. Well, I think we ought to look at that a little bit. They talk about the consumer. Don't do anything to hurt the consumer. We don't want to do anything to hurt the consumer because we realize that he has to eat the product that we're producing. But again, that consumer is buying his meat today, his groceries, cheaper per hour's labor than they ever bought it in the history of this country. Now, agriculture is getting less. We're getting less for our products every day. Now, you have to think about it in this way. We as farmers are consumers too. And the only way that we can consume is get a price for what we have to sell. If we don't get that price, we don't consume. And we're the biggest consumers in the nation. So I wonder if the consumer in the town would just as soon pay a little more for his groceries, put his fellow man back to work, because that's what will happen when you get agriculture's buying power back. That unemployed man in the city will go back to work. And as long as agriculture don't have their buying power, you're going to continue to have people laid off in the city. Because there's never been a time in the history of this country that agriculture was prosperous, the nation as a whole was prosperous. If agriculture gets to where it's not prosperous, then your nation goes down. Now, to show you the shape that agriculture's in, we're getting less and less of that consumer dollar all of the time. In fact, today we're getting just about of that consumer dollar what we got in the heart of the Depression of the 30s. In other words, we're getting about 38 cents of that consumer dollar, which is not enough to let the farmer make any money and pay his expenses and educate his children. So again, it all comes back to price is our trouble in agriculture. We're consumers in agriculture. We're the biggest. We have to have that price to do it. Now they talk about this surplus that we have produced in this country. I would like to hit on that just a little bit. How much of it actually is a surplus? Do you ever read anywhere, in any paper, any magazine, how much of that is a reserve for this country? I wonder, to listen to some of the papers and one thing or another, whether we need a reserve of food for this nation or not. Seemingly, we don't. You never hear it. You never hear anything about a reserve of food. It's all a surplus. Now. The reserves of war material that we hear a lot about these days is costing the government more money than what the so-called surpluses in the three seas are costing. Now, is that reserve of war material that is costing so much more money than the reserve of food is costing, is it holding the price down to the plant that is manufacturing that war material? I don't think it is. 
Is it holding the price down to the labor that's working in that plant? I don't think it is. But this little reserve of food that we're producing here in the nation, they're hanging it over the farmer's head to hold his price down. Now, what is the difference when you stop to think about those things? Well, about the only difference is that manufacturer is saying it takes so much money for me to operate the, rate this plant or I don't open the door. The labor in that plant is saying it takes so much per hour for me to work in this plant or I don't work. The farmer, on the other hand, is saying, what will you give me? That's the reason it's holding the farmer's price down. Now again, I just wonder if anybody here in the city of Indianapolis or any of the other cities around Indianapolis would want us in agriculture to attempt to produce just what you thought you'd consume in one year, that you wouldn't want any reserve? I don't think you would. I don't think you would want the farmer to try to produce just what you thought we could eat in this nation in one year. Now, we're only producing about 6 to 7 percent more per year than we're consuming right now. Now, should we get much closer? Now, that is all in grain and a little bit of dairy products. And if we were feeding the meat that we should be feeding in this country instead of importing it, I think then you could see that maybe we're not producing enough of grain in this country. But that is the way the corporations are controlling agriculture. I have been all the way since first of the year from Nebraska to the Pennsylvania border holding meetings in NFO. There's a lot of territory there. I've seen a lot of commercial feedlots. There's more of them through that territory now than there were a year ago. In other words, the average farmer is losing his market. We don't have too long to get together in agriculture and organize to price what we have to sell. That's the only way we're going to stay in business. Now to the business people. I would like to speak a little to you of what we're trying to do in agriculture and what it means to you. Now, there was about 200 representatives of the large corporations of this country that met in Washington, D.C. to solve the farm problem. They said the way to solve it was move two million farmers off of the farm. Send them into industry. Just get them off of agriculture. Get them out of farming. They said the way to do it was to lower farm prices, force them off, starve them off, any way to get them off. Now, how is that going to solve the farm problem? To you people in the small country towns, how's that going to solve your problem? Agriculture is what keeps you in business. I never owned a business in town, in the small cities, but I don't believe a business without customers would be too good. And that's your customers that they're talking about moving off of the farm. In other words, nearly half of the farmers that they're going to move off and move into industry. Now, they didn't say anything about the four to six million people that depend on them two million farmers for a living, and that is you business people. Who's going to pay the interest in that local bank? Who's going to buy the shoes in that store? Who's going to buy the groceries that those families bought? The automobile. That's your customers. They're going to be gone. They're going to move them into a larger city, into industry. Then I didn't say anything about the five to six million people that's unemployed in the cities today. They didn't mention that. So add it all up. You've got somewhere between 15 to 20 million people unemployed in this country. What are you going to do with them? I don't know. They didn't say that. But I have to guess at what they're going to do with them. The thing that I can see and what I think they're going to do with them I'm going to try to work, make a living, 
That's what I'm going to try to do because I've got a family to raise. So it looks to me like they aim to throw us on the labor market to bust labor. Then they'll have cheap labor to operate those corporations, their factories. They'll also have cheap labor to operate these corporate farms that are left. And you can bet your bottom dollar that if they get rid of two million of us farmers, that the farm that will be left will be controlled by the big corporations of this country. And I'm thinking that's not too good for the country. They like to get this land in large hunks. There may be a lot of farmers sitting out here today that think they have their farms and have them paid for, maybe a little money in the bank, that they're all right. But the thing that you want to stop and think about is, can you keep, compete with the corporate structures when they take agriculture over? So I think you can see to the small businessman what we're trying to do in agriculture means as much to you as it does to the farmer. Because if we go out of business, the small business is going to go with us. Now, how are we going to price in agriculture? That's the thing that everybody wants to know. Collective bargaining, that's what we want to do. We want to sit down to the table with the processing industry of this country. Sit across the table with them. We're doing it now. We're getting contracts signed. We want to continue to do it that way. Listen to their problems. Tell them ours. Get together. Sign the contracts to stabilize this market, not only now, but in the future. And we're getting it done. We're making headway at it. But if they don't continue to sign, then there is only one thing left for the farmer to do. And that's hold those commodities off of the market until we do get a price. Now, I realize to some of the people that holding food off of the market sounds a little bad to you. It sounds wrong. But now let's stop and think about that just a little bit. I've had people say to me, well, that's un-American. Well, if it's un-American to hold that food off of the market, then all America is un-American because that is the way America operates. They operate through holding actions. And that's all we're trying to do again is to get in position to operate like other segments of the economy are operating. That's why I've always said there's nobody, I don't care who it is, can put up a decent argument Again, what we're trying to do because we're only trying to get in a position to operate like other segments are. Now, I don't care what it is today that we buy. It has a holding action on it. They hold it for a price, whether it's groceries, meat, automobiles, tractors, clothes, whatever it is. That's the American people's way of doing business is through a holding action. Hold it for a prize. Well, that's just what we're doing. We're trying to get into that same position that we can price our commodities so that we can live. Make enough of money on these farms to stay on them so as we won't be going to town and taking that city boy's job. He's that place he should be working there, not some farmer working there and farming too. But agriculture's got to the place to where you can't hardly make a living on these farms and the fellows go to town and get them a job. And if they're getting a price, they wouldn't be doing that. So that's all we're trying to do is to get in that position, to price. And it's not going to hurt that consumer. If everybody takes their proportionate share, you can raise farm income 10 or 12 percent. And it only makes about a 4 or a 5 percent raise to the consumer. Now, if everybody doesn't take their proportionate share, then should the farmer continue to take less because somebody between the farmer and the consumer has got a little crooked? Should we as farmers continue to take less to protect that man? I think probably that's a little bit of the consumer's fault. Maybe the consumer better be looking in and see who is hooking him between him and the farmer. That's part of his job. 
We can't afford to continue to take less because somebody between us and the consumer is taking more and his just share. So we're going to have to quit worrying in agriculture about somebody else. We're going to have to begin to worry about our own business, our own family. That's our duty. We're going to have to price to protect them. That's our duty. In other words, once the American farmer makes up his mind to say that here is the production, here's the price, you're going to pay it whether you like it or not, from that day on, the farmer will get his just share out of this economy. But until you do, we're not going to get it. We're going to continue to slide down. So if we have to hold that food off of the market, then there's nothing wrong with it because to get that prize because that's the way everybody else does. How does labor win a strike in the meat industry? And I have nothing wrong with it. But how do they win that strike? They win it by not killing that meat, by not delivering that meat. In other words, they win it with the farmer's bargaining power. How does milk haulers, people that handle milk, how do they win a strike when they have a strike? They win it by not delivering that milk. They win it by holding it off of the market. That's how they win their wage raises. But still, they don't want the farmer to do it. They don't want him to do that. But I don't care what it is. What we produce on these farms, whether it's milk, it's meat, it's corn, it's soybeans, whatever it is, just the minute it leaves the farmer's hands, every hand it passes through from there on, it's used for bargaining power. Everybody that handles it, they'll hold it for a prize. They put a price tag on it, and they hold it for that prize. They use it for bargaining power until it reaches the consumer's table or wherever it might go. But still, they're telling us as farmers to not use it. It's all right, they say, for everybody else to use it after it leaves the farmer's hands. But don't you as a farmer use it. You better wake up. You got about 90, 95 percent of the investment in it. The rest of these people that handle that food has got from about five to ten. And that's the only bargaining power you have. And if we lose the power of this production that we're producing on these farms, if the corporations get control of this production before the farmer does, then you've lost your power. And I'm not too sure maybe that you haven't lost your freedom when you get right down to it. So you see, nobody can argue against it too much because we're only doing what other segments of the economy are doing. We're only operating our own business instead of saying, what will you give me? We're just getting in that same position to operate like our people in town, all business, all industry operates, in other words, operating like business people should operate, not say, what will you give me? And there's nothing wrong. It's perfectly legal. We're organizing the organization under the Capra-Volstead Act, which is federal law that gives the farmer the right as producers to organize and price his commodities that he produces on that farm. And that's all we're trying to do. We can't price it too high. A lot of you out there worry about, well, where are you going to have sense enough to stop? If you start getting a price, the law can stop us. We can't price it above the parity level, what we should have, because then the Secretary of Agriculture can file an injunction against us. Now, as far as the control of the organization, you hear a lot about losing your freedom when you join the NFO. I can't see where you do because we're only getting together to price. That pricing has to be done by the farmer. The contracts has to be approved by a two-thirds vote of the members. So I don't think 
whenever two-thirds of the farmers has to vote on something, I don't feel as a farmer I'm losing my freedom. I feel I'm keeping it because I don't think two-thirds of the farmers is going to vote for something that is not good for us. You never did see it. They never did. Two-thirds of them vote for anything that wasn't good for them. So I think we're keeping our freedom whenever we can do that. The contracts has to be come down to your county levels, be approved there by this two-thirds vote before they can ever go into effect. So the organization is strictly controlled by the farmer from the bottom up, not the top down. I want to make that plain. And we have our own surplus disposal in the organization. Through this, the government is going to have to make up their mind what a reserve and what a surplus is. That they're going to have to do. You can't find that out today. Everything that we produce is a surplus, according to what you hear. Through this, the government is going to have to make up their mind what's a reserve and what's a surplus. That reserve of war material that I was telling you about that costs so much money, it's up to all of us, the farmer, the man in town and all, to pay taxes to buy that reserve of war material. Then this reserve of food that is left over, or the reserve of food that we need, it's up to all of us to pay taxes to buy that too, all of us, not just the farmer. Then what is left over from that reserve we as farmers produce it. It's up to us to take care of it, what's left over from that reserve. And we can do it with just a very small checkoff from each producer. In other words, let's go back and take corn as an example. I'll just take the one because that's about all we have time for. They say the reason that we don't get a dollar and a half a bushel for that corn is because of this 3 or 4% that we're producing per year more than we're consuming. Well, let's get the dollar and a half for the corn that the market is going to consume. Let's take a check off off of each producer to keep that 3 or 4% back here. We'd still have, oh, dollar 46 right in there for our corn. We'd still have the 3 or 4% back here to do with whatever we could find. But the way it is, that three or four percent's calling us to get a dollar or a dollar and a dime for that corn. So I think that would be a good investment. And the same way, the same thing will work on all farm commodities, your livestock, your milk, and all. So, but we don't aim to destroy that, what's left over. That's not our idea at all. We aim to put it into the hungry stomachs in this world one way, shape, or form. We don't aim to pile it up here let it rot, make millionaires out of somebody in the storage business. Now, the total idea or the answer, I might say, to the farmer's problem is your production that you're producing out there on that farm. What you're going to do with that production is going to solve agriculture's problems are going to turn it over to the corporations of this country, just whichever you as a farmer wants to do. You're either going to continue to take that production to the chain stores and the processors and say, what do you give me, to let them use it to beat you and your neighbor down with, or you're going to use that production to put on the side of your neighbor and price it. That is a decision that you have to make. Well, I think my time is drawing pretty well to a close. There'll be a lot of meetings in NFO. Tend them, come out, everybody's welcome, and I thank you for letting me come into your home this afternoon. <clears throat> The preceding program, Why the NFO, was paid for by the National Farmers Organization and was presented to equate farmers in this area with collective bargaining for agriculture. The speaker was Mr. Glenn Utley, Indiana National Director for the NFO.